Hello and welcome. I'm Jeanette Gastelgate, VP at Clarius. We're excited that you're joining us today. We've been collaborating with ultrasound educator, Dr. Camilla Edwards since 2021, and we're excited to welcome her back today as she joins us from Cambridge, England for our live webinar, Practical Small Animal Ultrasound, Guiding Diagnosis and Management of Palpable Abdominal Masses. In a moment, Dr. Edwards will teach us how to characterize masses and how to obtain a definitive diagnosis using ultrasound guided procedures to safely obtain tissue samples. I'd like to welcome you all. We have a global audience today and I hope it's sunny in your corner of the world. A big thank you to the Vet Show and NABC for inviting many of you to join us. You're among 3,200 doctors of veterinary medicine who registered for today's popular event. The webinar is race approved thanks to the vet show so please do stay on for the full session to qualify for one CECPD credit. By participating for 50 minutes or longer you'll receive an email from the vet show in the coming week to redeem your educational credit. After the main presentation we'll see live scanning with sonographer and Claris clinical manager Shelley Gunther and her furry supporting character Mabel. At any time during today's webinar you can use the Q&A box. We'll have a live Q&A session with Dr. Edwards following the presentation and live scanning. Let me now introduce you to your host. Dr. Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. A passionate POCUS educator, Dr. Frankel has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career. He practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician and serves as chairman of our medical advisory board. Hi, Dr. Frankel. Hi, Janice. Thanks for having me again here today. And to set the stage for our discussion, we did our usual due diligence in doing a broad literature review. And I wanted to review some of the highlight articles to set the stage for Dr. Edwards' discussion. The first one I wanted to highlight was a review that we've discussed in prior webinars about how ultrasound really provides excellent non-invasive real-time evaluation, specifically in this article about lymph nodes that are both deep but also superficial and palpable. And the ability of ultrasound adds a wide array of additional characteristics to these masses that can help you further interrogate them uh, with some of the features that are uniquely available to ultrasound and available in a point of care setting. The next one is that one set of organs specifically that can also be visualized where important and useful information can be obtained at the cage side is the adrenal glands, where again, ultrasound really performs excellently in providing clinically useful and relevant information that sometimes might not be accessible with other imaging modalities or other tests available to the vet. And finally, this is a bit off the, the direction, but it's a question that comes up really frequently in our webinars is how do we practice and learn to get better with point of care ultrasound? And we love this article because it shows that you don't necessarily need expensive commercial simulators to really improve your skills. In this study that really highlighted and focused on novice scanners, a low cost simulator can rapidly improve skills on the order of just a few scans of practicing. And there's no reason to believe that this doesn't generalize to other organ applications beyond just renal scanning, which is what this study focused on. So before we get to the, the deeper questions about uh, specific applications today for abdominal masses, we wanna see how frequently do you use ultrasound in your veterinary practice? We have practitioners from across the world, various stages of their practice. Is this something you're just learning today or you're using rarely, or is it really something that's already in your daily practice? So we know where to target our education for you today. And we're going to close this out here. And let's see where we're at. Okay, so we already have a third of you at daily use, which is excellent. And another third weekly, and then maybe the last third is sort of just coming up to speed. And I think you'll agree that we have no one better. Uh, we're so happy to invite back Dr. Edwards, who can really address people at all levels of their scanning practice. Dr. Camilla Edwards is passionate about the first opinion level, small animal veterinary ultrasound. She travels with her dog, Pippi, within 50 miles of Cambridge as a peripatetic veterinary ultrasonographer. Camilla teaches ultrasound with Celtic SM MR, Photon Surgical Systems, and FOVU, and has built a thriving Facebook community that I'm sure many of you are already part of. Through her website, she reviews ultrasound machines with general practice small animal vets in mind. Camilla qualified as a vet in 2006 and has worked all over East Anglia, U UK, and Camilla's experience, as you'll see in emergency and critical care, having gained her CERT AVP in 2018. We're so happy to have you back, Dr. Edwards. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Oren. Um, it is great to be back. It's been a little while, so um, it's great to be back um, talking with uh, you guys at Clarius. So today I'm going to be talking about practical small animal ultrasound uh, and guiding diagnosis and management of palpable abdominal masses. It's a really 
interesting subject because it's something that we all come across in general practice um, that palpable mass that we feel in the abdomen of our small animal patients. So um, we may have a patient that comes in um, with very varying symptoms. They may be anorexic or uh, losing weight or possibly even feeling fine and they're just coming in for a checkup. And when we palpate their abdomen, we discover a mass. Um, and so we really want to know how can we investigate this further and um, figure out how important this mass is, what the diagnosis is and what the prognosis is and treatment options. Um, so one of the very useful things that we can use to get there is ultrasound and I'll explain how in this webinar. So when we're palpating um, a mass in the abdomen, we can sometimes presume the specific organ it's associated with, um, for example, if it's in the location of one of the kidneys, um, but often we'll just get a vague um, awareness of where it is in the abdomen, maybe in the cranial abdomen or the caudal abdomen, but we don't really know specifically what organ it is associated with. And then we'll combine that with the history. Um, so like I said, they, whether they're very unwell with this or whether it's just incidental that we've come across it and combined with the signalment. So um, certain breeds or um, age of animal, for example, might um, um, hone us in on a, a more likely diagnosis. So let's look at how ultrasound can help us. So in this web webinar, I'm going to cover four different um, ways that ultrasound can help um, us diagnose what this mass is in the abdomen. Um, and we'll look at some cases where ultrasound was really important um, to um, working up the case. So th the first thing I'm going to cover is it, that ultrasound can really help determine uh, the exact organ that the mass is associated with, but you do have to use ultrasound responsibly to get there on, on that front. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Ultrasound can really help characterize the mass. So we can determine whether it's cystic or whether it's soft tissue, how vascular it is, all these types of things um, ultrasound can really help with. We can look for local invasion or evidence of metastatic spread, which obviously changes the prognosis massively um, in our cases. And then finally, we'll look at ultrasound guided sampling, um, which can really help us with getting a definitive diagnosis and um, prognosis and treatment options, which is really what we're aiming for. OK, so let's first of all look at how we can determine the organ of origin of the mass. So I talked about that we have to use ultrasound responsibly when we're doing this. Sometimes it can be very tempting to jump straight onto the mass with the ultrasound probe and then try and figure out what it's joined to. But it's much, much better to do a full systemic ultrasound examination of the abdomen and then rule out organs as you uh, scan all the way through in two planes and then rule in organs that you really can see the attachment to. Um, it's a much better way round of doing things because um, if masses can often move things in the abdomen. Um, so if we immediately put the probe on the, on the mass, we may make mistakes about which organ it is. And it also means uh, that we don't miss any significant pathology if we do a full systematic exam of the abdomen. OK, so let's have a look at a case where this was really important. So we had a 12 year old male neutered um, domestic short haired cat who had a history of uh, deteriorating body condition score, um, had weight loss um, over a period of weeks, uh, previously had lots of UTIs, uh, but had recently been diagnosed as a diabetic, although that wasn't well controlled yet. There was no hair regrowth. The cat was a bit pot bellied. And we'd found this mass um, that we'd palpated in the mid abdomen. So we're going to look at some um, some uh, images that we took from this cat. 
And we, if we'd immediately put our probe onto this mass here, we could well have suspected this was the spleen. It lay in very much um, the position that, that the spleen laid in, um, but we took a systematic view um, of the abdomen because it wasn't clear what organ this was associated with. Um, and we can see that we've now come to our landmarks of the left limb of the pancreas. So we've got our stomach with its beautiful rugal folds there um, in, uh, on the cranial um, side of the screen. So uh, the left-hand side of the screen, we're, we're trying to keep cranial and the right, we're keeping caudal. And we can see the transverse colon coming in here. And then we've got our spleen in the near field. Um, and we've got our, our splenic vessels here. And that tells us that we are basically looking in the region of the left limb of the pancreas and seeing no normal structure that could be the left limb of the pancreas. This makes us highly suspicious that this mass could be the left limb of the pancreas. Um, so we want to investigate it a little bit further and try and follow it a, a bit more. Um, but certainly it looks quite large if it is the left limb of the pancreas. It looks quite dark, hypoechoic. Um, and the surrounding tissue fairly bright or hyperechoic around it. So following this organ, we can see there's even a cyst within it um, and there's no sort of normal looking pancreas there, but it does follow the path that the left limb of the pancreas would take now down round towards the stomach where the body of the pancreas would normally lay. So that really highlights that we're thinking this is the pancreas. Again, here we've got the spleen in the near field and we've got this very abnormal structure, which is our mass here. Uh, it's very heterogeneous. There's some cystic areas within it as well. Then we moved over to the right hand side of the animal um, to look at our landmarks for the right limb of the pancreas. So we've got our duodenum here. Um, we can see the lumen running through the center. We've got one side of the wall here, the other side of the wall here. And then medial to it, we've got this uh, structure here. And this is where we'd expect the right limb of the pancreas to do, to, to be lying. And um, again, we can see this mass here. So we've really proven that this is the left limb of the pancreas that is a mass. And we've found no normal pancreas also. So here we're still on the right hand side, we've got the duodenum, we're just following that down towards the stomach to see if this mass also follows down and we can see the pancreas there, that right limb, and we can see it following, following down towards the stomach. So again, proving that this is pancreas. So there's the stomach, follow it up to the duodenum and this pancreas follows that. So in this case, we found evidence of massive changes in the pancreas. Um, with It was heterogeneous with cystic structures seen throughout. It was uh, very well defined because it was hypoechoic and the surrounding um, tissue was hyperechoic, um, but it had um, uneven margins and was grossly enlarged. So this was the mass that we were palpating. So we found no normal pancreas. Um, and we found this mass in all the areas we'd, we would expect the pancreas to do to be. So ultrasound really helped us out there figuring out which organ was involved in this case. OK, so moving on to the way that ultrasound can help. Number two is um, in characterizing the mass. So we're all um, really keen to get to a diagnosis. So often when we're scanning, we will try and jump to what do we think it is? What do we think it is? And if we can slow our brains down a little bit and really um, appreciate what it is we're seeing um, and characterize it, then um, we're more likely to get to a correct diagnosis in the end. So. Um, we, we need to think about the size and shape of the mass. Um, measuring it is, is a great thing to do. Um, is, is its position uh, influencing any organs? Is it pushing it any organs more cranial or more caudal than you'd expect? Um, is the echogenicity of, of the mass um, uh, um, 
as you'd expect for that organ or um, does, does the mass change the echogenicity that we would expect there? Echo texture as well, is, is it heterogeneous um, like the case we saw with the pancreas or is it homogeneous? Um, we can look at the edge. So um, we may be looking at the edge of uh, a particular organ to see whether um, there's something sticking out from the edge of the organ but also looking at the edge of the mass itself. Um, how well defined is it? How uneven is it? Thinking about the distribution, is it focal or multifocal? Um, is it in uh, both organs, for example, if it's in the kidneys? Um, and then thinking about circulation. So putting color Doppler on, that can really help us understand, um, even to the extent of, is this actually uh, a mass or could it be a blood clot? Is there no blood flow through it? Um, so really helping us to, to characterize what, what's going on with that mass. Okay, so here's a demonstration of um, us scanning the left kidney in Pippi, my dog. Um, so we can see that I'm uh, starting the Ziffy sternum, moving up uh, the costal arch up to the left kidney, which is just coming into view here. Um, and we can characterize this kidney. We can talk about the size, so we can, we can measure the length of the kidney and see how that compares to what we'd expect. Um, the shape of the kidney is that as we'd expect. Um, and think about the uh, position. Is it more cranial, more caudal? Um, looking at the echogenicity, the cortex should be hyperechoic compared to the medulla. Um, is there good definition between those or do they seem too similar in echogenicity? Echo texture, they should each of those, the medulla and the cortex, be quite homogen homogenous. Um, and thinking about if we do see any pathology, um, it, it is, uh, how is that distributed? Is that distributed in both kidneys or in one focal area? Um, and then we can look at circulation as well. So it's important to fan through in both planes um, in an organ, but also in a, in a mass that we find in the abdomen. It's so good to, to really emphasize this, Dr. Edwards, of, you know, when we, we talk a lot about image generation and the protocol to always follow the same protocol to say scan a kidney, but then also that image interpretation really benefits from this kind of rigid rubric you're using the same one every time, every time you see a mass, you know, you follow the same steps, describe the same things so that, you know, when we do find these confusing findings, right, we know we can guess where does this really fit in the pathology or how the patient's presenting. Exactly, exactly right. So this is a case um, which really um, demonstrates how we can characterize a mass. So this was a, a seven-year-old female neutered boxer who had a history of uh, inappropriate urination, vomiting, PUPD, hematuria, proteinuria, and um, the vets who, who um, were dealing with the case had thought they'd seen something a little bit scary on the right kidney and asked me to come in and scan for them. So this is what we found on the right kidney and it was a bit scary. So we've got the kidney up here, we've got the cortex. And as we fan through, we can see the medulla. So the dog was panting um, quite a lot. So there's a bit of movement on this image, but then we can see this mass extending out um, from here. So we can think about the size. Um, we can, can measure the size of this mass and we can think about the, the shape of it. It's certainly distorting um, the shape of the kidney as we'd expect it. Um, we'd, we'd expect a, a kidney around that sort of size and shape, but this mass is extending all the way out. Position wasn't really affected. It, the position of the kidney was, was where we'd expect it to be and it wasn't really influencing any other organs so far as we could tell. Okay, so we looked at, at, at size, shape, position, then we looked at um, echogenicity. So um, thinking about the, the cortex um, looks fairly normal there. Um, and we could see some areas of, of normal medulla. And then this mass seemed quite heterogeneous. Again, we can see areas that are hyperechoic, areas that are um, hypoechoic. Um, so I, I'm not sure we could see any cystic areas um, where we'd be expecting an anechoic area with an acoustic enhancement below it. We weren't really seeing anything like that, um, but thinking through this process could really help to eliminate that, that thought. 
Okay, so we've done size, shape, position, um, e echogenicity, echo texture, and thinking about the edge of the kidney. So up, up at the top, the edge of the kidney is quite, quite normal here, but obviously down here, it changes dramatically. Um, okay, and distribution wise, we were only seeing this in the right kidney, the left kidney was perfectly normal. Then we want to also judge circulation. So applying color Doppler is really useful. We can see there's some, uh, certainly some blood flow through, through the, the, the mass in, in places. Very difficult to get good color flow when we've got a panting animal. So um, the nurse was crucial in, in just getting the dog to calm down for a moment so we could see some blood flow in that area. Okay, so. Um, characterizing this mass, we, we had um, this right kidney with, it, with its associated mass. The size of the mass was about eight centimeters by five centimeters. It was a, a, a large oval mass um, extending ventrally and medially from the right kidney. Um, the position didn't affect the, the right kidney at all. Um, the echogenicity and the echo texture the um, cortex was hyperechoic to the medulla um, and the mass was also hyperechoic to the medulla um, and it was um, heterogeneous. The edge margin of the mass was uneven. Um, distribution, it was focal, associated only with the right kidney, not the left. Um, and then with the circulation, we were seeing um, some circulation, but it wasn't a very vascular mass. We did take a fine needle aspirate of this mass and it um, revealed that it was a uh, renal carcinoma. So the plan in this case had been to um, uh, go to surgery to remove the affected kidney, but unfortunately um, the dog deteriorated very quickly and didn't make it to surgery. So our third way um, where ultrasound can um, prove very useful in investigating is uh, looking for spread or invasion of local organs or lymph nodes. This is something we can't really palpate our way to. So we feel that one large mass, it could be something that's very easily surgically removed. It could be something that's not uh, important, it's incidental but it could also be something that's split, spread to lymph nodes or um, other organs or even invaded um, other organs. So ultrasound is really useful for um, assessing this. So we use ultrasound, particularly looking in two planes can really help us to assess where, um, where an organ is headed or where a mass is headed and where it's, where it's going. Using color flow mapping is really useful if we're worried about um, 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 masses that are invaded blood, blood vessels um, and then assessing all organs systematically to look for potential metastatic spread. So this is a case where that became very important. So this was an 11 year old male neutered cockapoo who had a sudden development of ascites um, and which with a blind um, 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 ab abdominocentesis, it was revealed that it was a high protein transudate. Obviously an ultrasound guided would be safer, but the vet had done that before um, we got there. Okay, so this is just to demonstrate how severe the ascites was. Um, we've got, um, and this is what we really could palpate on, on the animal, we could palpate all this ascites. We've got all this anechoic free fluid. This is actually the urinary bladder um, that pops into view there. So this anechoic um, round structure is the urinary bladder. Then we've got all this free fluid. We've got mesentery with um, um, loops of intestine within it um, as well. So that was mostly what we could palpate. Here um, it revealed was what was the cause of that. This is our, our kit, one of our kidneys, but this is taken from the left-hand side, but what we're actually seeing is the right adrenal gland here. And we can compare it um, to the size of the left kidney here. This right adrenal is, is enormous. For a dog this size, we would expect um, a width of about half a centimeter to three quarters of a centimeter. Um, and, and it was nearer three centimeters across here. Um, we've also got the aorta and the caudal vena cava here, and we can just see the 
um, caudal vena cava um, squeezing past because this adrenal gland has invaded the caudal vena cava. So here we've got a still image so we can really compare kidney size compared to adrenal size here. There's a massive distortion there. Um, the adrenal gland should be tiny in comparison to the kidney. And what we can also see is this is the only area where blood was trying to um, flow past this mass within the caudal vena cava, this thin anechoic line here. Um, so we had a severe obstruction um, of the caudal vena cava and this was causing the ascites. So here we can see a little bit more free fluid and then we can also see the left adrenal here, which was also enlarged. It's got that more classic peanut shape, um, but it was also very much enlarged. So um, in this case, we had bilaterally um, really massively enlarged adrenal glands, which were homogenous, um, but had a deformed shape. Um, the right adrenal gland appeared to be invading the caudal vena cava, and that can cause Bhutchiari syndrome, which causes high protein transudate ascites, like we saw here. And this is when blood flow um, from the abdomen is, is um, severely blocked, as in this case. So um, we, at this point, were assuming that the, um, the tumour was actually non-functional because the dog was well in itself otherwise, other than the ascites and, and the um, growing side effects from, from that. But um, it, it, it was not something um, that had um, caused Cushing's or anything like that. So, um, so this was a, a really interesting case and ultrasound really helped us to um, figure out what the next step should be for the client um, because surgery was going to be much more complicated with an invading tumour. Okay, so the final way that ultrasound guided, um, some, uh, that ultrasound can help in the case of a palpable abdominal mass is by using guided sampling. Um, so this can really help us lead to a definitive diagnosis, like we saw in the kidney case. Uh, we, we got a definitive diagnosis of renal carcinoma, and that can really help us um, um, determine prognosis and discuss with client treatment options. So we can do this by either taking a fine needle aspiration or we can take an ultrasound guided biopsy. These are relatively safe um, and ultrasound make the, makes it even safer because we can judge whether, um, whether the, the area we're putting the needle in is very vascular. Uh, we can avoid certain areas um, if um, they look like they might rupture, for example, um, and we can avoid putting the needle through other organs and seeding, um, seeding tumours. So often it, it gives really useful information. It often gives a definitive diagnosis, which is always what we're after. And this means you can give a good idea of prognosis to your client. OK, so this is an example of taking a fine needle aspirate on a phantom. So um, we're just lining up. We can see um, we've got this fake olive in the um, in the phantom. I'm putting the needle. So I always make sure it's the side which got the light that I'm coming in, which is shown by this marker on our image. I'm just placing the needle down through here, down to the um, the lesion that I want to sample. I do a little woodpecker movement. Um, to try and gain some cells before I withdraw the needle. And all the time I'm looking at that on my screen so that I'm avoiding um, all the things I want to avoid um, when I'm taking that sample. Okay, so here's a, a case where um, ultrasound guided sampling really helped. Um, so this was a 19 year old female neutered domestic shorthead cat who was off their food and was suffering from weight loss. So here we've um, got a view of the abdomen. This was a skinny old cat. So although we were only looking a few centimeters, this is actually the, the other side of the abdominal wall. So we're looking through the abdomen here. And uh, because the table is just on the other side, we get quite a nice mirror image artifact um, showing up here below. Um, so we can see all these loops of intestine. 
Um, this is jejunum that we're looking at. We've got lumen in the center, and then we've got a dark mucosa, a hyperechoic submucosa, and then a, a darker muscularis layer. And in this case, the muscularis layer was just slightly more prominent, a little bit more thick than we'd expect it to be. What we also found was this uh, enlarged jejunal lymph node. So quite prominent. Um, it stands out a lot more than we'd expect. It's got blood vessel running through the center of the two um, jejunal lymph nodes. Um, so looking um, abnormal there. So again, looking here, we can just see that the wall layering is just slightly off in this case. The muscularis layer is just slightly thicker than we'd expect. And that's throughout the jejunum. And then we've got this larger jejunal lymph node. So here I'm looking at how can I take a sample? Um, I um, would love to take a sample from, from the jejunum, but it's not really thick enough for me to be able to get a good sample without the risk of, of um, um, putting the needle into the lumen, which I really don't want to do. Um, but the jejunal lymph node is also affected. So um, that seems like a good um, thing to try and sample. Um, so my needle will be coming in from, from this side and I really want to avoid gut. I've managed to get the jejunum up really, or jejunum lymph nodes up really close to the body wall. So I know I'm not gonna go through anything here, but I really want to get um, the jejunum lymph nodes moved over so that I can uh, avoid putting the needle through any loops of intestine over here. So here I've managed to do that and I'm measuring to see what length needle I need um, to get a sample from this lymph node. Um, I always measure, it's always really good practice so that you don't uh, attempt to find needle aspirate and realize that you can't actually reach the lesion. Um, also applying color Doppler in this region to make, make sure there's no large vessels that you're going to poke the needle through as well. Okay, so here are, here's the needle going into the jejunal lymph node. I'm doing the woodpecker um, technique before um, withdrawing the needle and then squirting the, those cells onto the slide. So there we go. So in this case, it was really important to um, use a, a relatively non-invasive technique. This was a 19 year old cat and the owners didn't want to put the cat through major surgery or um, biopsies that would take a while to recover from. So we needed to get as much information as we could in the least invasive way possible. So we found this thickened muscularis layer throughout the jejunum and we found, found these enlarged hypoechoic jejunal lymph nodes. And really that, that leaves us without a, a, a really good working diagnosis because those signs can equally be neoplasia such as lymphoma or inflammatory in intestinal disease. So an FNA, which was relatively safe, um, relatively non-invasive, um, did um, give us a, a diagnosis of, uh, to work with, which was mild reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, it made inflammatory bowel disease much more likely uh, than neoplasia. So it gave us something to, to work with um, and uh, without putting this 19 year old cat through something too traumatic. Okay, so great. Um, what are the take home messages today? Um, that really it's key to perform a systematic exam. Um, that way we can rule in or out organs. We can pick up on any uh, metastases that have happened to, to other organs. Um, and and that, that can really, really help uh, with getting to a diagnosis. We need to characterize that mass. So we need to slow our brains down and uh, not try and jump to the diagnosis um, and really characterize it because that can really help us with the building blocks to deciding what, what is going on. Um, using ultrasound to look for local invasion and possible metastatic spread. Again, using that systematic exam um, is crucial. 
And then finally, using ultrasound guided sampling is relatively um, non invasive. We don't need a full general anesthetic. Um, often a, a mild sedation will do, it's not painful. Um, so it's a, it can be a really useful tool to get into that definitive diagnosis. So um, if you, you've enjoyed looking at the cases, um, I've got uh, various different courses coming up in the autumn. I've, they're all four weeks long and online. Uh, I have scanning the emergency patient, um, the basics, the trickier bits and basic echocardiography. Uh, we go through lots of different cases in each of those and not for forgetting our nurses and techs. We have a six week course for you. Um, you can find those courses at fovu.co.uk forward slash ultrasound hyphen courses. So thank you very much for watching. Um, I have a free ebook gift for you um, over at fovu.co.uk forward slash clarius um, uh, called veterinary ultrasound for the complete beginner. Um, also, I will send you an independent Clarius C7V HD3 review and also a 10% discount code for, for um, any FOVU course of your choice. Thank you very much for listening. Great. Thanks so much, Camilla. You make it look so easy sometimes. And to show uh, maybe even how easy some things are and things that might take some more practice, we're going to have Shelley Gunther do a quick demo here, our clinical marketing manager. I encourage you all to keep using the Q&A. We have a lot of great questions that we're going to get to before the top of the hour. And if you keep filling that up, we will take Dr. Edwards through as many of those as we can. But first over to you, Shelley. Thanks, Aran, and great presentation, Camilla, as always. And yeah, Aran, like you said, I mean, it, it she does make it look easy. And, uh, you know, through the webinars and classroom videos that I've watched, um, I have been able to figure out a few things uh, not having any experience with uh, veterinary ultrasound before I joined Clarius. So um, I am going to just head over to uh, my dog, Mabel. She's uh, behaving for now and uh, she's lying on her right side. So I'm going to look at her left kidney and possibly spleen. Um, and we'll just show a little bit of uh, technique for that. All right. So the first thing I want to do is just draw everyone's attention to um, the presets here. And I'm going to be choosing the abdominal preset, but all of these ones with the orange dot beside them are part of the membership, the advanced veterinary package. So they just give you some a um, little bit better fine tuning for your imaging. And um, yeah, it'll just kind of get you closer to where you want to be along with the measurements that you may want to, to do in that specific exam. So we'll um, select the abdominal preset. And Mabel is not shaved, right? You're just she is not it. shaved. No, I'm just parting her fur. She's got fairly thin um, fur, but I've just parted it and put some gel here. Um, now, the other thing, because she is getting a little bit antsy here, is I'm going, this is fantastic. I'm going to go into the tools menu here and turn on voice controls. This way, I can tell the ultrasound system what to do and calm her as well if I need to. Um, the other thing is if we're doing a procedure, we can also, you know, be using both hands and still be able to operate the, um, the app uh, while we're doing that. So just let me get a little bit better positioning here. So a midline, um, long axis or cranial caudal and Mabel's abdomen. And we've got a whole lot of nothing down here. So I'm going to um, decrease depth, decrease depth. And these, this is just one of the commands that, uh, that the voice controls can do for us. I'll do one more. Decrease depth and increase gain. Great. Okay, Dr. Edwards, what am I seeing here? So you've got, you've got spleen there in the cranial part of your image on the left. Right here. Okay. Yeah, so if we, if we look for, for the kidney, it should be just around there. If you just fan down slightly... You should come across it. There's descending colon. Ooh. There's, there's a oh, there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Increase gain. Great. So here's the kidney right here. So I've just kind of slid along the costal margin. Yeah. And so you may descend. find that because um, you've got a full descending colon there. So um, you might find a little <laughs> bit of pressure might might help move that out of the way and get you closer to the kidney. Is this the colon here? that I'm seeking? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, okay. 
All right, so a little bit of belly massage here, Mabel, sorry. <laughs> she looks quite relaxed about it. Yeah, she's mm -hmm. good, she's good. Good, so as you said, we can freeze the image and actually perform a measurement if we were unsure about the size of our, of our kidney. So just by putting the calipers, I'm getting my 5.4 centimeters here, 54 millimeters, and is that within normal range? Yeah, that, that sounds very good for a dog her size, yeah. Excellent. And then I can just unfreeze again. So as we far as echo, sorry, go ahead. We don't want to find any pathology live on the call. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we don't, no, we don't. <laughs> so this is the, um, the Cort cortex out here. Yeah. And the medulla uh, is this darker area here. Exactly right. And we can see okay. there's, a, there's an even more hyperechoic area, and that's the area around the pelvis. Um, right in this area here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Good. Uh, looking at the, the size of the kidney we've measured is, is great, and the shape, it's kidney-shaped, fantastic. <laughs> um, and looking at the echogenicity and the echo texture, each of those areas are quite homogenous, and we can clearly see the definition between the cortex and the medulla. So that's yeah, very that's nice. nice. And the, the size of the cortex and medulla compared to each other should be fairly equal. And that, that looks true for Mabel. Um, the edge of the kidney looks very smooth, very nice there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we well, can then I would turn normal in, in, organs as well and characterize them as well. Yeah, yeah. So if I just turn um, 90 degrees, my scanner 90 degrees. So now I'm looking at the kidney in cross section in transverse view here. Yeah. And there's that yeah. big gas bubble there. So it definitely causes a big shadow, but yes. I can kind of maneuver around that and just fan from the upper pole down yeah. to the lower pole just to yeah. make sure that there's nothing in going exactly. on there and if, yeah. if the renal pelvis would be here so if she was right. obstructed we would see fluid in this area here that's right that's right so we oh. yeah it's really important to fan out the extremities on the organs so that you don't miss any pathology on the edge um really important great and then if we want i don't know if i'll be able to um, pick up any blood flow but i could turn on the color doppler here all right good well good we're getting fairly good flow in that kidney yeah lovely you can see where the renal artery is entering there yeah right in here yeah great lovely. all right good news mabel <laughs> <laughs> and now we have a 2d button where we can just exit um, um, the color mode here great all right Good job, Mabel. <laughs> nice. And no pathology. Hooray. No. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. It's, it's always, you're always holding your breath a little bit when, uh, when you're scanning a loved one or, you know. Yeah, you never know. That's true. Uh, Keeping a straight face. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, for Mabel and Shelly, for that. Oh, man. So many questions in the Q&A. We're going to get to those in just a minute. I'm going to hand this over to Janess, and then we'll get to the questions. Thank you, Dr. Frankel, and thank you, Shelley, and a big thank you, of course, to Dr. Edwards. Please, a uh, reminder to stay on for a full 50 minutes to qualify for one CECPD credit. Before we begin our live Q&A session, we have a question for you. This poll is an opportunity to learn more about our third generation wireless ultrasound scanners for your veterinary practice. Please complete this poll to let us know if we can provide further information about our uh, Claris HD3 vet scanners. Do click on as many options as apply. Claris is available in over 90 countries. Pricing and availability does vary by region, so feel free to request a quote and pricing. I encourage you to do this um, before September 14th. You can save now before our scheduled price increase on September 15th. You may also opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. You can also book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claris HD3 in action. And we can send you more video tutorials for veterinary medicine with Dr. Camilla Edwards, so you can select that option to continue your education. Please go ahead and select as many options as you wish while I take a minute to tell you about Clarius HD3. 
for the highest definition wireless ultrasound imaging to speed diagnosis and for safe procedural guidance for animals small, medium, and large. Our C3HD3 microconvex VET scanner, which you saw in action today, is specifically designed for clear clinical imaging for small and medium animals like cats and dogs. We also have the C3 convex VET for larger animals like sheep and horses and the L7 linear VET for superior animal MSK imaging often used in equine applications. Now 30% smaller and lighter, more affordable and with an enclosed battery, our third generation family of VET scanners are unrivaled for high resolution imaging and a handheld ultrasound with dedicated animal presets. Claire shows you the fine details you need to investigate an area of concern, perform a fast exam, and make a confident diagnosis on your patient's first visit to expedite the right treatment plan. Each scanner is designed with not one or two, but eight beamformers and 192 elements that deliver the same image quality and speed only found in traditional systems, but at a mere fraction of the cost, representing 85% savings. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons to optimize imaging and streamline workflows, making your scanners fast and easy to learn and use. Claris is also wireless with zero footprint for high portability to scan animals where they are from the vet clinic to their homes. You get free movement with no wires getting in the way or startling the animals, also making it so much faster to clean and disinfect. Only Claris delivers wireless scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS or Android devices with free updates. Available with our new membership, Clarius Cloud is available to save and manage unlimited exams and create reports anywhere. Your membership includes in-app Clarius Classroom videos with experts like Dr. Edwards, as well as onboarding with a Clarius clinician to build your ultrasound scanning skills. And Clarius Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. With your membership, you get exclusive access to AI-powered features like voice controls that you saw in action today, and you get our popular advanced veterinary package, which offers more flexibility and additional tools and advanced workflows for uh, various animals and examinations. For example, with finely tuned presets characterized by anatomy, more comprehensive measurements, needle enhanced for procedure guidance, and the new OB growth tables for both cats and dogs to obtain more accurate estimation of gestational age and fetal growth. With increased ultrasound billings, you'll see a rapid return on your Claris HD3 VET scanner, which is ultra affordable. We'll now close off the poll in three, two, one. Thank you. If you ask for more information, we will get back to you in the coming week. Our last poll is actually an invitation to pre-register so that you can join us for our next practical small animal ultrasound series with Dr. Camilla Edwards. It's entitled Guiding Diagnosis and Management of Disease in the Gastrointestinal Tract. Please complete this poll to save your seat for our September webinar and we'll send you a confirmation email in the coming days. I'll give you a moment to save your seat. Let's now begin our live Q&A session. Please use the Q&A icon in the menu bar to ask your questions for Dr. Edwards. Because this is a common question, I do wanna let everyone know that in the coming days, we'll send you an email with a recording of today's webinar and a PDF copy of the presentation. And if you stay on for at least 15 minutes, you'll receive an email with a link from the VET show to redeem your CECPD credit. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Frankel to moderate our Q&A session with Dr. Edwards. All right, lots of questions. A lot of people want to know more about FNAs, Camilla. Uh, I guess first question, I mean, we, do, we have a whole webinar on this, so we can refer to that too, um, but maybe we can just address a couple of the quick questions in terms of um, people want to know, you know, bleeding risk around the FNA. Do they need to check coagulation times? Um, and are there certain masses you wouldn't aspirate for concern? Maybe a hemangiosarcoma, something like that. Yeah, so um, certainly um, the the things that I would um, avoid avoid is um, particularly uh, masses in the urinary tract, um, which could be transitional cell carcinomas. They're, they've been shown to uh, potentially seed cells into the abdominal wall and then um, to produce a mass or, or a tumor in the in the abdominal wall in the musculature there. So um, that's one particular one that I would avoid doing an FNA initially. Um, I would go for something like a traumatic catheterization um, in the bladder. Um, to try and get cells there. But if I wasn't successful, then I would go ahead with a fine needle aspirate to get that diagnosis if, it, if that was required. Um, 
yeah, checking that it, um, it that that um, it's not particularly vascular, but also if it's a cystic structure, um, how sure are we that we're not going to pop it and release fluid into the abdomen? Um, and that particularly goes for the bladder as well. If we're worried the bladder wall is so diseased that it might rupture or the gallbladder as well. Um, those, those are things that I would potentially avoid. When it comes to coagulation, I'm not overly worried. Um, you know, the, the size of needles that we're using, you know, 21G, um, 23 gauge, they're, they're not huge needles. They're needles that we would um, use to take jugular blood samples from animals. And we're not taking uh, coagulation tests before we take a jugular sample. So um, if you're happy doing a jugular sample with that size needle without doing a coagulation test first, then you're probably okay doing a fine needle aspirate in the abdomen that's ultrasound guided is my thought process with that. Yeah, I would say a jugular vein is pretty vascular structure. <laughs> the puncture, yeah. Yeah, but we do that every day and we don't think about it so right yeah. right it's funny how we kind of uh you know attribute risk in different places interesting um this came up a lot in our fna webinar uh but you know still we can maybe could reiterate it today um if you aspirate or just woodpeck yeah so um initially i always just use the woodpecker technique so that's just moving very quickly backwards and forwards very small range of movement in within the lesion and um, I already have a bit of air in the syringe when I do that so that when I remove the needle from the lesion I can quickly um, squirt out those cells that are caught in the needle hub so I, I'm really only getting a very very small amount of, of cells but that is plenty um, usually to get um, a, a good sample and do a squash preparation. So I use two slides against each other and move them away from each other. Um, and that will get a thin one layer of cells, which the pathologist will like to look at. Um, obviously, if we, if we get too thick a sample, the pathologist can't actually distinguish what's going on. They need a single layer of cells. So you don't need very much. If, however, I've um, given it a few attempts with a woodpecker technique and I'm not really getting any slides that look like they've got much on at all, then I might attempt a very gentle aspiration um, to try and get a, a few cells that way. But really Just putting I'm, a bit of vacuum on the syringe, right? A exactly. bit of back pressure on the syringe. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really difficult to do, though, because when you're putting that back pressure on, you're very likely to um, aspirate while you're re removing from the lesion. You could be aspirating from muscle wall, from mm. other things as you're leaving the patient. And then as soon as you um, get, get the needle out into the air, it sucks all that sample into the syringe. Um, and potentially it's very difficult to get out again if it's a very small mm -hmm. sample. So, um, yeah, I avoid aspiration if I can and probably only need to use it, you know, uh, I don't know, one in one in uh, uh, 80 times that I do samples. It really, really is quite rare that I need to do it. Nice. How small of animals do you do you take the ultrasound down to? Um, well, I've, I do kittens and puppies that are quite small, um, but yeah, guinea pigs and, and rabbits we occasionally get to do as well. Mm -hmm. I haven't mm -hmm. really done anything uh, smaller than that. My youngest daughter wants a hamster, so I probably will scan that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. collect the collect the images for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it was pretty impressive that very skinny cat, you know, when you're measuring the size of the needle, to make sure also i was going to say you know not to puncture all the way through right like you could have easily hit the bed with a you know slightly larger if you're not careful yeah yeah so i, I, think I feel was... like more frequently we we underestimate the length of needle that we need um i right. feel that that is more more common than i i think we're we're overly cautious with fine needle aspirates mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, yeah we would recognize that the needle was too long if it was going to go through <laughs> you would hope yeah yeah. yeah, I like this question. What abdominal organ is your least favorite to aspirate? Ah, uh, well, yeah. When, once they get start to get deep, the lesions in the liver, then it then it can be quite difficult to to get to. Also because of its location, 
underneath the ribs and you've got to decide whether you're going to go into costally or find a position you can lay the animal in to get to so it can be quite challenging to get a good sample from a, a, a deep liver uh, lesion and do you ever put the patients in a dorsal position um, either for scanning or if you need to aspirate yeah so i'm a big fan of scanning in lateral um and uh one of the reasons for that is that um we halfway through the examination move the animal so any sediment or sludge in the bladder or the gallbladder gets moved around and i can have a quick look at what movement is going on because that's one of the advantages of ultrasound is that we can see movement we can't do that with radiography we can't do that with ct you know that's that's a huge advantage advantage of ultrasound so that's why i like scanning in lateral but when it comes to taking fnas I just need the animal in the best position where I can get the lesion as close to the probe as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that can be all sorts of positions, whether that's even slanting the table slightly so that the organs fall away from, from the area that I'm interested in or yeah, So absolutely do, do um, scan them in dorsal when I need to get to close to a lesion. Great. Great. Uh, that, are you always sedating the animals to do the FNA? I presume you are. Um, yes, but sometimes it's quite a light sedation. Um, again, we're talking about um, you, we wouldn't sedate an animal to do a jugular puncture. <laughs> so, um, you know, if we've got an animal that's quite compliant and we're using a very tiny needle, then um, we might not need very much sedation at all. Um, and perhaps it's just an opioid might be enough to um, relax them enough to, to take that sample. That's great. Um, people, there's also questions, uh, this came up also with, uh, with the FNA webinar, you know, how can people practice? Can you just say a little bit quickly, reiterate, uh, you, had, you had your little olive model uh, of teaching people how to do it? Yeah, so um, the Phantom I was using uh, is one that's uh, commercially available to buy, um, but you can make your own um, Phantoms to, to practice on. So uh, I know with Shelley, we, we did in that, that uh, webinar, you had a, a, a chicken breast, was it, or a, some meat of some sort? Yeah, I, I had a chicken, a chicken breast and I just inserted an olive into it yeah. and my olive had a pit in it, so that was very you know, it nice. had a lot of shadowing, but sometimes it's really nice to get one with a pimento because then you can actually see the red if you've aspirated successfully. So oh, yes. um, there's lots of different options sure. out there for, yeah. for yeah. making your own phantoms. Yeah, you can also make jello and put olives in there and, and use that. So there's, there's lots of different ways to do it. Tofu as well works. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, well, we are reaching the top of the hour. I think we got through most of these questions. Uh, last question maybe here is, I don't know if you can answer this, your preference of sedation, general sedation protocol. Is there something you can speak to there? Yeah, so um, we use ultrasound on such a broad range of animals with a broad range of conditions. So we can't say there's a perfect sedation for ultrasound. We need to take into account the condition of the animal, the age, the severity of disease, cardiovascular status. But I would say, you know, you, you're doing the best uh, sedation you can, taking those things to, into account, but also use drugs that you're familiar with because you'll be more likely to spot if there's a complication, you're less likely to make dosing errors. Um, so use drugs that you're familiar with um, as well is really important. Sounds great, expert advice. Well, thanks so much for all of your questions. If we didn't get to any of them, we will be following up in the coming days. Dr. Edwards, thanks so much. And I'm gonna hand it over to Janice to close us out. Yes, and just a friendly reminder as well uh, that in the coming days, we'll send you an email with a recording of today's session as well as a PDF copy of the presentation. And if you stayed on for at least 15 minutes, you'll receive an email from the vet show as well with a link to redeem your CECD credits. I encourage everyone to complete the survey as we close out so that we can continue to bring you great educational content like today. And I'd like to conclude by thanking Dr. Edwards and also thanking Dr. Frankel, Shelley, and all of our furry supporting characters. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us today. We hope to see you next 
in September for our webinar with Dr. Camilla Edwards. In the meantime, keep scanning. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye, everybody. everyone.